Thank you for joining us for another Learning with National Leaders virtual event presented by Seitman Cancer Center and Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. I'm your host, Angie Weidinger. Tonight we're discussing skin cancer as well as the importance of preventative checks, diagnoses, and treatment. We're also going to share the sun safety actions we can all take right now to help prevent skin cancer. Before we welcome our guests, we want to give you some important statistics about skin cancer. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer before the age of 70. Approximately 9,500 people in the U.S. are diagnosed with skin cancer every day. Most new cases of skin cancer are among Caucasians, but other racial and ethnic groups are not immune, so everyone must take precautions to reduce their risks. Non-melanoma skin cancer, including basal and squamous cell carcinomas, affect more than 3 million Americans each year. Melanoma is more common in men, those with fair complexion, and more exposure to natural and artificial sunlight. In 2020, there were an estimated 1.4 million people living with melanoma of the skin in the U.S. A quick reminder to our viewers, you can submit your questions throughout the discussion and we'll stop periodically to check in on those questions and do our best to answer them. Now let's introduce our panelists. Joining me tonight is our patient duo from Siteman Cancer Center, medical oncologist John Visconti. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And your skin cancer patient, Chief of Police, Steve Johnson. Who Thank you, you Absolutely, and I've heard you want us to just call you Steve tonight, is Please. that right? Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you for being here. It's gonna be a good conversation. Thank you, absolutely. Before, before we get into your story and, and all about what, what you've gone through in your experience, I wanna talk with you first a little bit about um, melanoma. That's the cancer that we hear about most. But it's not just melanoma when we, when we talk about skin cancers. No, there are three main types of skin cancers. There's basal cell, there's squamous, and there's melanoma. And basal cell has, is the most common. It's about two million cases a year, where squamous cell is about one million, and then melanoma is about 80,000 cases a year in the United States. There is some prediction that there's probably five million cases of skin cancer in the United States because some of the extra two million is not detected by the patient or not by the physician and not even diagnosed. Yeah, well, we mentioned some statistics. How common is skin cancer compared to other cancers? So skin cancer is the most common type of, of cancer compared to breast and lung and colon. Wow, interesting. And we know there are a variety of factors, obviously, that can cause. Um, what would you say are the leading causes of skin cancer? So the leading cause of skin cancer is obviously the sun. Mm -hmm. The sun exposure to these uh, portions of the body that are exposed over time. Most of the skin cancers are cumulative sun exposure and site-specific, so basically where our skin is uh, open to the sun. And, and then there are some risk factors that are not related to the sun. Uh, the second most common would be in, indoor tanning booths. And so that is also an important risk factor. So for squamous cell cancers, that increases the risk of, uh, at around 67% more than someone who does not undergo tanning at a tanning booth. Wow. Melanoma ranges between 40 and 60%, so quite high. And, and that is the concern these days why melanoma incidence is increasing. Interesting. Well, screening, of course, is an important part of diagnosing cancer sooner um, when more treatable. Are there any other screening guidelines, guidelines that, that we should be aware of? Interesting that there is, uh, that is controversial. In the United States, there's really no specific uh, screening uh, tools or, or programs because the data, the scientific data, is lacking. Uh, and when the, let's say, the United States Preventative Task Force, which is a subsidiary of the government, looking over screening measurements and screening tools for various different cancers, they look at survival data. Mm -hmm. And just because skin cancer has not been studied that well to look to see if it's made a difference with aggressive skin examinations, Therefore, it's controversial. However, I think, in my opinion, and most experts do, that uh, 
uh, routine skin examinations by the individual, by their friend, their family members, as well as their primary care physicians, or maybe a dermatologist is worth doing that, especially looking for anything that is uh, unusual. Okay, so when you say unusual, define what you mean by unusual. So if we look at the basic, and I kind of like the A, B, C, D, and E portion of a skin lesion, I call it lesion, but a bump or mole or something that's out of the ordinary, then so A is asymmetry. So if you look at the specific uh, mole, if one side is different than the other, then that's concern. B as in border, is the border very circular or very ir irregular or jagged? And that's a concern. Color, if there's different shades of color, that is also a risk, a risk that this could be skin cancer. Diameter, so anything more than a pencil eraser is concerning. Okay. And then of course E is evolution. How is this bump, this mole, is evolving over time? Is it growing, is it getting bigger? And so those, all those factors are important to pick up skin cancer early. And when you do a screening, I mean, that's basically, you're looking at those, those guidelines as well. Yes. That's what a screening entails. Correct, correct. Okay. And then, so skin examination is for the most part looking at the whole body at least once a year. Um, that's by a professional, uh, as well as looking for lymph nodes, checking the neck, checking the underarms. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's very important because some skin cancers can go into lymph nodes like melanoma or squamous cell. And so th that type of um, approach would be the best to pick up anything early. I see. Okay. Well, let's check in real quick here for a viewer question. I think we may have one. Um, oh, there it is. What age should kids start getting skin cancer screening? So the, the earlier the better. So we're looking at probably... Um, kindergarten really? on, uh, on up. And it's, it's not looking for skin cancer that early. It's, it's really trying to limit the sun exposure. Mm. And so application of sunblock, um, talking to the uh, child about not staying out in the sun too long, not trying to get a sunburn, trying to have appropriate clothing if you're going to be out in the sun um, very long. The hours of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. are the key uh, time for the maximum uh, ultraviolet radiation to the skin. And, and I think just the education of the child, uh, the constant um, um, uh, approach to that individual so they also learn how to change their behavior right. in trying to minimize future incidents of skin cancer. I know we were going to talk about this later, but since we're talking about kids and, and sunscreens, I mean, it's important to keep those sunscreens on them. Does it matter what kind you use? So not necessarily. So anything that is with, so SPF is sun protection factor, and you would want at least a 30 or greater um, to adequately prevent the damage of the skin from the ultraviolet radiation. And so anything that the children want to take, whether it smells, it smells better or, <laughs> right, you can or get looks on better. Them, right? yes, yes, yes. I see. Very good. Well, Steve, let's talk with you a little bit. You're the chief of police with Fairview Heights, Illinois. Yes, Thank you for your service. Uh, thank you. Um, talk, tell me a little bit about your journey. How did this, how did you come to find that, that you had skin cancer? How long ago? What, how did this all begin for you? Well, first of all, I wish sitting here listening to Doc I would have known him when I was about 11 years old because <laughs> right. I literally violated everything that he said. Uh, I grew up with blisters on my shoulders and my feet. And of course, my mom tried to put sunscreen on me when we were camping and swimming. And I didn't listen to any of that stuff. And having red hair and fair skin, um, I was I, I burned a lot and it was dumb. But you didn't I, I never thought skin cancer was that big of a deal. So what had happened to me about five years ago, actually um, pretty close to five years ago tomorrow, uh, I was moving uh, my family and I, with a box, I hit the back of my right calf and I had a little mole there that, um, you know, guys, you don't check stuff like that. When I hit it with the box, it started bleeding and I thought, well, that's strange. So um, being a guy, I waited eight months to go to a dermatologist and get it checked. 
And when I went in, uh, they did a biopsy of it. And I'll never forget, they called, and I didn't know this dermatologist, but when they called, they said, I'm sorry, it's melanoma. And all of a sudden I thought, well, what are you sorry for, melanoma? That's just skin cancer, that's no big deal. I had no idea it would be life-threatening and could be the end. I just didn't think that way. So I go in, uh, they sent me to a surgeon. Uh, the surgeon did a phenomenal job, but I really expected it to be a pretty small scar and it looked like a shark bite out of my leg. And when I woke up, I was like, holy smokes, that's a really big incision. And then they had also taken lymph nodes out of my waist because it had uh, gone to there. So um, my, uh, that they had originally sent me to an oncologist and I was talking to my wife and she goes, well, let's go, let's go to your primary care doctor first and let's talk to them and make sure we're going the right direction. And my primary care doctor said, you are in the backyard of Siteman's. It is the number one hospital and trainers and learners and doctors in the entire country, if not the world. And I know Dr. Viscani and he saves lives every single day. Sorry for the pressure. <laughs> and he goes, that's where you're going. You're not going to this other person. I'm like, okay, okay. So we went there and we had a discussion about it and gave me different forms of treatment. I ended up getting a year of immunotherapy treatment, which is IV treatment. And um, from the day they called me and said I had stage 3B cancer um, to tomorrow is five years. So, and I have the designation of no evidence of disease right now. Um, but, you know, you're constantly watching it. And of course, I've had squamous and I've had probably another 30 basal cell that have been cut out in one way or another. Every time I go to the dermatologist, I said, look here, I, I, I think I, this needs to be looked at. And they go, that one's okay, but this other one's coming out. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that. Right. So I'm a huge proponent of go to a dermatologist, they know what they're looking at, and um, take these precautions. Yeah, it sounds like it's changed your life dramatically in the way you look at things. Significantly. I, uh, I mentioned earlier, just this weekend, I went boating with my family. It was my wife's birthday. And now I'm not afraid to go out into the sun, especially as a police officer. I, I have to. Um, we went boating, but I wore this huge hat. <laughs> I look like Casper the Ghost with sunscreen, <laughs> long sleeve shirt, but I'm out there and I'm having fun and I'm, I'm not gonna stop doing that. But it's always in the back of your mind where you're watching out and trying to be smart about it. I, I told Doc before we started, I have not had a sunburn since I first met him because it, it changed me in a significant, and my kids don't either. I was yeah. gonna ask, has it yeah. changed the way you look Significantly. at it? Significantly. I have a little redhead that start, starts uh, law school today, actually, and um, uh, tanning beds are banned, <laughs> and uh, lots of sunscreen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Talk a little bit about the the treatments that he mentioned. Again, the treatment that he had, it, it, it was not... It's immunotherapy. Oh, immunotherapy. So, so for melanoma, chemotherapy does not work. So chemotherapy has been abandoned as a form of any type of treatment for melanoma. Melanoma has immunological characteristics where it responds to the immune system or immunological effect and that's how it shrinks or gets destroyed. And so immunotherapy are drugs that right now are all intravenous. And what they do is they tell the immune system that there is a foreign cell in the body. And the immune system is then um, activated at kind of tenfold, very stimulated. And these, all these natural killer cells go after the foreign cancer to destroy it. So cancer has, in general, has the ability to prevent that stimulation of the immune system. So the immune system doesn't get high enough to cause any significant effect on the cancer. So therefore, these medications interferes with that stealth mode or that, yeah. that breaking system uh, and ex accelerates the immune system to kill it. We have several questions. So can you talk a little bit about, we're going back to sunscreen, I think, talking about SPF. What do those numbers mean? How do they work? So it's the degree of, of the, uh, uh, the medication on the skin to prevent the ultraviolet A and B to penetrate into the epidermis and dermis of the skin. 
And so the higher it is, the more, let's say, thickened or, bar or more of a barrier it is for um, the tanning of the skin. Okay. And the, I mean, 30, 50, 70? 100, 100, yes. 100? Yes. Yeah. I mean... So the higher you go, the more protection you have. Okay. I wear a thousand. <laughs> I have it on right now. Just to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's take another one. Another question. What does it mean when a dermatologist says, I would remove that mole, it could become cancerous in the future? So certain types of cancer, so squamous cell cancer, there are some precancerous moles. Mm -hmm. And the dermatologist, so when I go to my dermatologist, um, especially when they feel your arm, they look with their magnifying glass and they see these little bumps and they say, oh, that's precancerous. So then, then they inject you with liquid nitrogen and it freezes it. And so that is actinic keratosis. That's the term that is precancerous to precancers going into squamous cell. So okay. you're preventing squamous cell. Uh, there are, um, so melanoma is different. You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, uh, go ahead and freeze melanoma. If there is concern that it's melanoma, it is going to be surgically excised or removed. Okay. And so that's the, that's the reason when the dermatologist looks for these moles and they have to get rid of it, that's they're preventing the other type of uh, skin cancer. Okay. Oh, we've got lots of questions coming. Okay, how do you know the difference? They're all yours, haha. -ha. <laughs> <laughs> how do you know the difference between brown age spots and squamous or basal? So, so a couple things. Um, brown age spots are going to be, for the most part, uniform, uniformly brown. Uh -huh. Their border is more um, circular, they're not jagged or regular. Uh, it is those brown age spots that you suddenly start seeing shades of black or, or red or blue or something like that. That's, that would be the alert to go and get that um, removed. Basal cell, shiny, sometimes red patches, sometimes the color of a pink to a blue with some uh, shades of black and brown are very important to, uh, for, the, for you to see someone to get that looked at or removed. Okay, great, good advice. How quickly does squamous cell cancer grow typically? How quickly does basal cell cancer grow? So both of these cancers, if they are in an individual, with a competent immune system, then it may take 10, 20 years for the skin to mutate to develop into a precancerous mole for, and then onto squamous cell and basal cell. So for the most part, squamous cell and basal cell cancers usually appear around the age of 50 and beyond. And that's because of the chronic sun exposure as a child, a teenager, young adult, some, and the multiple sunburns that you may have had over that time frame. Okay. Whereas melanoma, and I'll take that question to, to go to melanoma, is a different. It, it can occur really anywhere from even as rarely in teenage years all the way up to old age. And the melanoma uh, can occur across all spectrums of individuals, any type of ethnic population. Okay, so those, those things that you just mentioned, those colorations, those, dif those differences, if you see something like that, should you schedule an appointment with your physician? What should you do? Yes, yeah, so right, if you have, you have doubt on a, a skin lesion or a mole or a bump, then definitely seek out your primary care physician or if you want to go ahead and make an appointment with a dermatologist, if your healthcare insurance allows you to make that direct consultation, that appointment. Okay, very good. Now I understand that when you and Steve met each other, you started to develop a treatment plan that included a lot of collaboration. Why was that so important for him as your patient? So with any type of cancer that's a little more advanced, that needs medical therapy, then it's always important to have a partnership in approaching that. Mm -hmm. And that the patient definitely has equal footing with input and decision making. And that's really the important because it is a professional relationship, a relationship that will be ongoing for quite some time. And, and it's not a marriage, okay? So I'm not taking care getting over his wife and stuff like that but but it is and then part of that team approach 
is gives the person the best product, best service, uh -huh. and making sure that that individual gets the best care. Yeah. And that team approach can be people in the back, so the pathologist, the radiologist, the surgeon, the dermatologist. All those individuals are very important in this the team approach for treating cancer. Multidisciplinary team, it, 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 that, that's what you're talking about, yes. all these different levels. Yeah, is that, when you were going through it, was that hard to navigate all of that or, you know, just talking with it him, with him, did that help you? Would it, it seem overwhelming? Because it sounds like a lot. It was very overwhelming. I, I, the, I think when we first talked, I don't think I heard anything you said. My wife was jotting notes down and thank goodness she wrote everything down. And of course, then I would reach back out to him and he would, the whole team would be able to answer there, questions. Yeah. I do remember the very first day Doc told me, do not Google it because so much of it will be wrong. So literally, I think when I got out in the parking lot, I Googled, Googled it and I had like my life expectancy was really short at, at the stage I had and I'm like, holy smokes. But then I remembered what he said, you know, immunotherapy is this breakthrough treatment the last 10, 15, 20 years that's changing all the statistics. And I think just hearing that from a really smart guy helped me dramatically and my family. Yeah, yeah, and, and like you said, being able to talk to him, and, yes. and that I'm sure is key, having that open communication too. Absolutely. Sure, okay. Um, we know you just mentioned that treatment options have changed significantly. Are there any other things besides, besides the immunotherapy that you talked so about? So for melanoma, there are two groups of uh, types of medications, immunotherapy, and targeted drug therapy. And then most of the time targeted drug therapy are oral medications, pills. And so some melanoma has specific mutations that they work on surviving and living. And so the, these pills target those mutations and turns that off, tell the cell to die. And so that's also a breakthrough over the past 10 years. And so certain individuals with melanoma fare better with those medications then with the immunotherapy. And then as far as squamous cell, so basal cell and squamous cell, they're curable, highly curable with just surgery alone. It is those individuals that they can't remove the, the skin cancer or the skin cancer has metastasized to the lymph node that requires additional type of treatment like immunotherapy again, or even targeted drug therapy. And I assume catching these things early is the key. Yes. So most skin cancers, greater than 90%, are, are, has a favorable prognosis, curable, curability, if caught early, yes. You said 90%? More than 90%, yes. Wow, that's Some remarkable. Some statistics think it's up to 98%, yeah. Wow, so. that's remarkable. We have several questions, so let's ask here, or check a look, take a look. Is using tanning beds, for example, 10 years ago for a month or two a risk factor or only current use? So, <laughs> asking for a friend, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so tanning booth is similar to just going out and laying on the beach or by the pool and getting sun. Yeah. So chronic sun exposure, chronic tanning, is high risk versus one or two sessions ten years ago. Okay. So c continued use is really a no-no because -no, uh, it increases your risk for developing any of these skin cancers, specifically melanoma and squamous cell. Okay, good. Another question here. Does a person who has a history of stage 1B melanoma need to see an oncologist or is it enough to just see a dermatologist for a full body exam every three months? So stage one melanoma uh, patients are highly curable with surgery alone oh. and all they need is to see a dermatologist and their surgeon or, or one or the other, whoever monitors their skin, uh, which early on is every six months and then probably eventually once a year. Very good. Okay, so let's talk about prevention. You mentioned some of the things that you've been doing, Steve, um, on the weekend, looking like the ghost and everything. Right. <laughs> what are some of the things that we should be doing as Steve's doing now? So for prevention, we talk about uh, sunblock. So again, application of uh, a specific SPF 30 or greater to the sun exposed portions of your body and that is, and also to reapply that every two to three hours, especially if you're gonna go into the water, whether it's the ocean or the pool or the river, 
And because otherwise, if you don't, and there's a misconception, you just apply it on early on and that you have it the whole day, that's not going to protect you because it will wash off or the perspiration of the body will dilute it and, the, and then the sun will, of course, damage your skin and you have a sunburn. Loose, art, loose clothing that covers up most of your skin, especially if you're out in the sun, especially working outdoors. A wide brim hat, okay? Yes, we, men like the kind of baseball cap, but that doesn't Leave cover the ears, the ears out, yeah. or the back of the neck. Yeah. And wear a so Gilligan forth. hat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and, um, and then just be conscious of the, of the uh, day. Um, 10, again, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. are the, uh, the time when the ultraviolet rays are the most intense. And so if you need to be out in the sun, try to do it before or after. And, and just those are the prevention, and, and as well as trying to be vigilant about monitoring your skin and, and seeing, at least making sure your primary care doctor sees you once a year and looks over your skin as well. Okay. We talked about kids a little bit uh, earlier. A lot of us parents like to use the spray because it's so much easier for the kids. It takes less time, but you need to rub that in as well, yes. right? So, yes, another misconception you could spray it on happened to me because I think, oh, I have to spray it. <laughs> That's and, great, and then, yeah. <laughs> and I have to rub it in and get your hands so greasy and stuff like that. But you have to rub the spray in, and you really have to uh, really make sure all the skin is covered by the spray or by what you rub in. Yeah. Otherwise, you just use the creams, which would be more effective. Is it true? Because I've heard people say, you know, if, if, you, if you get, you know, bad sunburns and things as a kid that you're more susceptible to develop skin cancer later in life or you have more of a, a chance of that. Is that true? So, so melanoma could come from just one bad sunburn. Really? Okay, as a young adult, yes. You just don't know. There's now no way of, way of right. <laughs> <laughs> information that would have been useful, huh? Yeah. So, so that's why the, the approach by dermatology and by everyone with involved with skin care and skin cancer is to try to get uh, the sunblock, the sunscreen early on in life yeah. to use that more liberally than, than just not and trying to get a tan. Right, yeah. Let's talk about some other misconceptions um, about skin cancer. Can you, can you tell us any, any other things that people may think that's not exactly true? So for mel so person having degree of pigmentation or melon, so light skin, dark skin, in between. So melanoma does not selectively hit just one population. It covers the whole population, all ethnic groups, all skin colors. Because melan, which is with, with the melancytes, can be found in various amount of other parts of the body. The eye, mm. the brain, the lips, the toenails, the groin area, uh, the GI tract, which is the digestive tract, any of that, those areas melanoma can develop. And whether it's you're an African American, Asian American, um, Caucasian, or Hispanic, whatever, you're still at risk of developing melanoma, whether you get maybe a sunburn or not. Squamous cell cancers and basal cell cancers, mostly white population, Caucasian, because we have less pigment, uh, and, and of course with chronic sun exposure with that. Yeah, interesting to note though on, on those things. Um, Steve, after being diagnosed with skin cancer, well, we talked about the, the uh, precautions you take now. Anything else that, that you, you know, like you said, you mentioned to your kids, anything else that you're doing differently? You know, do you not, you know, drive with the windows down, your arms sticking out anymore of your car, anything like that you do differently? Well, it's interesting being a police officer, I'm driving around quite a bit, so it always seems like the left side. Um, my personal cars, I had some additional screening put into the windows that blocked the rays a little bit without making it darker. That seems like it, it, it works pretty good, especially if you're going long drives. Um, I like to run and bike ride, and now I have more of a tendency of doing that early in the morning mm -hmm. or later at night when the sun's going down, it's not so intense. Um, and then the really big thing, I, I, I'm not, I refuse to be afraid. I'm not gonna just stay inside and play PlayStation all day long. I, I go out and I- That's not good for your health either. Right, I do like it, but, <laughs> but, I, but I'll, I, I, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna live life. I'm just much smarter about it now. Uh, when I'm out on 
at the lake, I'll start out with a, a ball cap, and then when we stop and I get in the water, I switch to my goofy-looking Gilligan hat, and, and I, I literally have a timer on my phone. Every two hours, I'm putting more sunscreen on, and I really like the spray because it doesn't feel so, right. I don't know, just not so bad, but then you got to wipe, you got to rub it in everywhere, and uh, I go through about a can a day. <laughs> When I'm when I'm out there in the sun doing yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. So um, just being smart of it, and then the other thing, the big thing I've realized is, like I said earlier, I'm gonna look at something, and think, oh my gosh, this is coming off. Like I don't all the description that the doc gave of different what they look like. I just started daydreaming during that <laughs> because I, my brain doesn't work that way. So yeah. I know go in and get checked. Yeah. And when I do, they're going to find something over here that I wasn't even looking at. Yeah. And then they take it out early and it's no big deal then. Yeah. So that's really the big thing for me. I keep thinking back to when you were talking about, you know, you thought it was just going to be this little surgery, no big deal. And you come out with this large scar. Yeah. I mean, is there anything that you've learned about you, about life through this process with 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 excitement, anything that you've learned about yourself? Yeah, at, at the beginning, I, 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 I know I was an idiot. Um, that I wasn't doing the things that I was supposed to be doing. And you saw this mole and I didn't really, I, I just always thought skin cancer was not that, that big of a deal. And then you find out it is very significant and you've really got to take care of yourself and, and get, the, get these checks, not only for me, but also for my family, you know? So um, I put it out on, and I'm kind of a, a close knit person, but I put it out over the internet. Hey, I had this little tiny mole it was life changing. The doc saved my life by getting me on this treatment and all that stuff. But the treatment wasn't a lot of fun, you know, that type of stuff. And things that happened along that time frame wasn't fun. But I'm alive today. So I advertised that out there. And I had like 600 of my friends that went and got checked. And some of them had things. But they said they only went and got checked because they heard my story. So yeah. that's what I think is really important is educating people. For sure. And like you said, you'd waited, I think, what did you say, like eight months before? Yeah, I was pretty dumb. <laughs> Nine months, so, I could have had a baby. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So now I assume you, if there's ever anything, again, you're not waiting eight yeah, months. Yeah, I'm calling the dermatologist. Immediately. Um, you're going to hear the lights and siren. I'll be there in a few yeah. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you just mentioned telling people. Is there anything else you would say to people that are like, you, you know, I, I, it's no big deal. I don't need to do this. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. I, I wouldn't, uh, like some of the questions were the way different things look, try not to worry about them, but yet go in and get checked. Right. Um, everything that I looked at, I thought it was nothing and it turned out to be significant, right. so. Let the experts take a look. That's exactly it. Yeah. And like Doc says, don't trust Google. Right, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, all right, let's, we have a couple more questions here. What about genetics with melanoma? Does it have the same correlation as other cancers? So there are several different hereditary uh, cancer syndromes that incorporate melanoma, and usually that uh, would develop early on in a person's life. So they have different onset early on, early age, mm -hmm. uh, multiple can be, but effectively treated with the same approach as regular sunburned melanoma. Okay, okay. Um, so what if blue light, Luvelin, is that how you say it? Treatment? When is it recommended? Did I say that correctly? I have blue lights. <laughs> Mine are different. Yeah, sorry, Doc. So um, that um, would be recommended for individuals with uh, uh, kind of those that cannot be tr treated normally. Okay. Um, so it's very rare that very uncommon to have that. Okay. So um, I don't even know what that is. So it, it could, it is essentially, I think what the um, audience is recommending or at least talking about is phototherapy. Okay. And how that affects the um, uh, onset of skin cancer or the treatment of skin cancer caught early. So it's not, not commonly done, let okay. me say that way. Okay. What would you say is a good source to get information online because we've already established Google is not. So what is? So, um, so Washington University Siteman Cancer Center is a nice um, uh, rev uh, source of information. Uh, the National Cancer Center Network, uh, NCCN, uh, is also a very important 
very, uh, very good and thorough um, resource for patients. They have physicians and they have patients. And it goes through different, the, all three types of skin cancers and goes into great detail about early on to later and different types of treatments and explains to them about uh, prevention and as well as skin examinations. Great, good. Um, here's another one. How often can you use Ephidix? Is that correct? Am I saying that right? Ephidix are similar on your face to get rid of precancer cells. So that's topical um, five fluorouracil, and that's dermatology. You use that when there are multiple areas of squamous cell. Okay. And and they can't do surgery all over, and so you could use that. You use that for a length of time, and then you'd have to break um, because it sometimes gets the skin can get really red and irritated. So you could use that multiple times. Okay, all right. Uh, we'll just keep going with these questions here. Is there a difference between sunscreen and sunblock? As long as it has SPF, is one better than the other? As long as it has SPF mm -hmm. and 30 or greater, it doesn't matter. Okay, all right, that's a good question. Um, how does flora, fluorocell? So 5-fluorouracil is Effudex, which is the topical uh, chemical treating, treating um, squamous cell cancers in in multiple different places where you can't remo remove it all. That's what you're okay. yes. talking about earlier? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> does vacationing in sunny places trigger possible skin cancers as all of us have just come back from sunny places for vacation? So yes, um, because on vacation, human, human nature is we are less rigorous with our um, sunscreen, sunblock uh, application. Uh, we are in shorts, we're in bathing suits and stuff like that. And so, yes, having to go to these vacation spots, especially in the South, can at least put you at risk if you're not vigilant about doing the um, appropriate preventative um, measures. Okay, one more question here. Is there any evidence that having melanoma once means you are more likely to get it again? Yes. So yes, there is risk factors that if you get melanoma, then it is very possible that another part of your body that has been exposed, that has been damaged, can develop melanoma later down in your life. Very good. Well, we've had many questions from viewers tonight. Thank you very much. A great conversation with both of you. Thank you, Dr. Visconti, and thank you, Steve. Thank you, Angela. Really, really appreciate you both sharing your story. It's been fascinating. Our pleasure. And so that wraps up this evening. We're excited to announce that we will have another event coming up on November 2nd. That will be about clinical trials. So you can come right back here to this site to sign up for that event happening very soon. Also make sure to check out Siteman's new podcast, This Is Cancer. You can hear more stories from patients and the doctors who treated them. You can listen to This Is Cancer wherever you listen to podcasts. Meanwhile, we invite you to visit yourdiseaserisk.com to learn about your risk of 12 cancers and other chronic diseases and to get personalized tips for preventing them. As always, thank you so much for joining us.